Hi, can, can you can you hear me? Yeah. I think. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. I'll do a voice check as well. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Thank you. Thanks for joining all of you. So my, plan, so my plan is I will just uh, say a couple of minutes, five to seven minutes. And after that, I'll present each of you. So which order you want to go with your last name or certain order you prefer? Uh, let's do the alphabetical. So so you need yeah. to first. <laughs> oh. I'm not sure it's a good idea, but uh, I can go first. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, uh, how long for individual uh, presentation? Like at, 10 most, minutes? At, at most 10 minutes, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I hope there will be some question and question at the end. And feel free to answer those questions. I think that for the question and answer, they will submit the question at the back channel of, uh, of the chat private chat and then I will forward to backstage and no backstage will forward to me then I will read those questions and then you will answer it probably you may not see the question so my understanding is that uh, the question will be sent to me through their channel and then I will share with you or tell you and then after that you guys can start to answer it And they said, okay, the, all, all the questions come from the coming from the audience will be posted at the private chat. I guess if you access the private chat, you can see it. So how many participants are here? Relief is asking you whether, Latifa, you're going to start. Yeah, I will start at uh, 340. Session will start at 340, right? Oh, I see. That's my understanding. According to the schedule, just for, I think, uh, just for checking, we start a little bit early. So at 340, we'll start and officially it goes all the way, it should go all the way to 5 p.m. Uh, 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. So one hour, 20 minutes. So then we have a 15 minutes presentation and a 30 minutes uh, question. Yeah, you can say. Okay. Latifu, so he's, he's asking you. Uh, yeah, you better you tell him who is uh, speaking next. You, you, you should give Philippe an order because he controls all of our screens. I, I will uh, introduce you. So let's say I will start with uh, Professor Bartino and then once she's done, then I will tell, I will introduce you maybe, and then then um, you can start to talk. So that way, so the plan is first, I will I will talk about 10 minutes at most with my slide. And then uh, I will introduce uh, Professor Bardino first in the alphabetical order, the last name in order. So, and then uh, she will start to share her screen and give a talk. And after that, we should open the floor immediately for the question and answer for her, or we wait at the end after all of you present. Which which one is better? It's better to wait at the end. We are already actually in the public, okay? People are listening okay. to us. Okay. Okay. It's okay, no, it's not that we are doing anything in secret. Okay. For the public, we are deciding how to get organized. Okay. okay. So yeah. So each each of when your presentation slot will come, I will introduce you, and you can start okay. to present. And after that, the floor will be open for the question and answer. So that's my plan. At okay. the end of everything, right? At yeah. the end of all the all the, all of you. Uh, at the end of all the panelists, who, once they once you guys present, then at, after that, the floor will be open for public. Okay. Philippe asks you to take the stage now because we are in the public. Okay, so let me. Can I, sh can I share my screen? Philip? 
you you have texting him. I think he only read the chat. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. Philip, uh, can you sh uh, share my screen? Well, if I send you a text, okay, very good. Thank you. But I think there's some delay anyway. Uh, okay, ladies and gentlemen, hello, my name is Latifu Khan, and I'm the I'm the panel moderator of this panel. And in this panel, we'll, we are going to talk about opportunities for data analytics, a machine learning service in the era of COVID-19. So in this panel, we have a distinguished number. We have a very distinguished speakers or panelists. Before going to in, before going to introduce each of these panelists, I want to say a little bit about how machine learning or data mining service can help us to curb the COVID-19 pandemic. So more specifically, machine learning or data mining can work with the data management, can work with the computer vision or image area, can work with the social media or social analytics, and can work with the privacy to overcome this uh, to achieve this goal so more specific in this uh, more specifically you can think about we're going to talk about more details about more details about how that machine learning oh people choose the right time this <laughs> somebody's trying to call me from the team Okay, so anyway, so here, the key point I'm trying to make here, so in this uh, panel, machine learning will work with the data management, will work with the computer vision or image area, will work with the social media or the privacy area to control or to curb the COVID-19 spread. Okay, so here, machine learning, uh, how does it work with the data database management system? Nowadays, you know that um, dashboard is one of the way to display COVID-19 status report, how many uh, cases are there, how many deaths are there at a certain geographic location. So underneath what they use, this dashboard, they gather the data from various sources like CDC, uh, WHO, and so on. But most of many cases, this data is incomplete or erroneous so i would like to see uh, from the panelists how they uh, they can talk about a little bit how the how database research can or in machine along with the machine learning can help us to overcome this problem second computer vision area is a very popular area nowadays because it, there's a lot of success in this area lot of success in this area okay lo a lot of success in this area due to the deep learning and so on now this can be also useful in case of covid 19 just think about uh, when that there is an increase in the number of pa patients in the hospital for due to the covid 19 
So in that case, uh, radiologists will be busy to analyze those images. So the idea here is um, for the radiologists, if we can develop some tools where the, the when we have the images and some of the images, uh, let's say X-ray images or the CT scan images, and we want to categorize it either is a co related uh, the image is related to COVID-19 COVID-19 patient or it is related to the normal patient or it is related to the viral pneumonia. So that way the radiologist will uh, will, be, will have less pressure or burden will be reduced. So their machine learning can play a significant role. And then nowadays, you know that many of us have a big presence in the social media. And there is some status analysis show that COVID-19 outbreak can be predicted from the social media, especially from the Twitter. The idea here is when at a particular state or a country, the number of tweets related to COVID-19 increase significantly, you can say that uh, the COVID-19 will be imminent at that location. So for example, uh, uh, from China, the, there is a equivalent, a Twitter equivalent product called Weibo, and they predicted in 14 days, uh, 14 days in advance that at this particular geographic location, a special location means province-wise or state-wise, the COVID-19 will be, outbreak will be imminent there based on the tweets. So Basically, COVID-19 tweets grow significantly uh, from 1.5 million per day in February to uh, 4 million per day in October. So based on this, you can do some sort of prediction. Now, most of the previous work, I noticed that they focus on the only on the on this number of tweets related to COVID-19. That's it. But they don't focus on the content. Content or the Twitter message itself contains a uh, lot of useful information. So the, here, the, some of the tweets talks about the problem in Italy with the COVID-19. So if you if you can do the analysis, then we can do a lot of good thing here. And it can give you the sentiment analysis or the it can be useful for the policymaker to update the decision, whether the certain geographic area people like the social distancing or some uh, like that. And uh, Last but not least, contact tracing is one of the way to curb the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. But traditional contact tracing is usually labor intensive and time consuming. For example, uh, there is some uh, University of California, San Francisco, one epidemiologist said that uh, contact tracing using the traditional way takes 90 minutes per patient, so which is very expensive and time consuming. So can we do better using the digital way? So there is a mobile location tracking GPS system can be used and Taiwan utilized this system and they're very successful to control the COVID-19. But the main concern there is privacy is a big issue. And we have a, uh, some panelists are uh, doing a lot of research in privacy. So I hope they will cover those aspects. And last but not least, uh, machine learning area uh, one of the traditional way the machine learning works, uh, the data will be moved from the client to the server and the cloud server or some uh, centralized server where the once you have the, all the data, the machine learning algorithm will be built there and so on. But the, due to the security or privacy issue, many parties do not want to share the data. So that's why federated learning has been proposed where uh, data the, the centralized server will share some of the machine learning parameters to the clients and the clients will update those parameters and forward to the server so this is called new concept called federated learning and i believe federated learning can play a significant role in and uh, to handle the covid 19 also so now i would like to introduce uh, so that's the uh, end of my uh, pre presentation at this point but uh, let me introduce you to our distinguished panelists. So I will start with the Professor Bartino first. Give me one minute to read her CV. So, uh, professor Bartino is a professor at uh, Purdue University in Computer Science Department. She was a professor uh, before at University of Milan, Italy. She was a, a, she had, uh, she was a visiting scholar or science researcher at IBM Alamadan. And I, in a, I, I just want to highlight her uh, work. So her research uh, currently focuses on cybersecurity and privacy of cellular networks and IoT system and, and edge analytics for cybersecurity. She is a fellow of IEEE, SCM, and AAAS. 
recently she got uh, 2000 uh, recently I mean this last year or this year she got SEM Athena lecture award so let's uh, welcome professor Bartino she will uh, give us uh, some of uh, our her uh, understanding about this covid-19 okay um, thank you a lot for the nice introduction so and uh, now i'll uh, uh, like to start uh, my slides um, can you see them? Uh, can you see the slides? Mm, one minute, let me. Uh, no, we see you and me. Okay, let me say to Philip. Uh, you have to put your slide as a full screen mode. Yeah, that's what I've done. Yeah, it's can now. You yeah, now we can see it, yeah. Okay, thank you. So basically, I'm going to follow up this very nice introduction by Latifur by uh, elaborating a little bit on privacy. But before I do that, I want to mention that today we have a lot of technologies that when combined together, they can really speed up our, uh, uh, let's say, um, our development of solutions that will address important worldwide challenges. And those technologies include AI, big data analytics, but also Internet of Things, 5G cellular networks, and even the new incoming 6G, which is still being under you know, a visioning process. Now, those technologies, when you combine them all together, they can allow us to capture data in a very pervasive way in both space and time, but also very fine granularity. In addition, we can extract knowledge and recommendation from that, often with the real-time guarantees. But in addition, that will make the devices control systems and cyber physical systems intelligent and autonomous. Now, these technologies in particular can, can play a key role in what we can define health security. So health security um, includes precision medicine where care is tailored to specific patients. We have seen that the COVID may manifest with many different uh, side effect uh, symptoms. And perhaps each individual will need a very tailored uh, um, care, uh, specific drugs and so forth. And in addition to this, uh, uh, this technology, if you were to look around uh, on CNN and many social media, you can find a lot of interesting examples. And of course, uh, uh, which usually we combine IoT AI in various ways. Interesting examples are touchless samples and techniques which allow us to reduce, avoid the touching things. Okay. For example, now when we go do shopping, we need to touch things a lot. In the future, we may not need to do that. Of course, that will require actuators, intelligent systems. We just need to look at something and those devices can pick up these things for us. Uh, of course, uh, uh, you can see devices which can alert uh, an individual when he's getting too close to somebody else. In other cases, uh, uh, the system can analyze the images and estimate the distance and perhaps quickly alert the user that they are too close or uh, use this as a post, uh, let's say, warning to the user. Of course, uh, a lot of technology has already gone into this um, social uh, contact tracing and uh, usually those applications, they use a lot of technologies like mobile application, Bluetooth and so forth. But our real goal uh, that we should really aim at would be not to just react to those pandemics. So those techniques as it is, social contact tracing are really 
been developed to react to something which uh, had really become worldwide affecting the entire world. We really want to be able, that should be our ambitious goal, to even prevent this type of pandemic. Preventing them uh, very quickly or possibly detecting them, no, preventing them, which means just making them not happening, or if they happen, prevent them and stop them and contain them. Now, this is, I believe that with these technologies, we could achieve that. But as you can expect, try to achieve this very challenging goal, which if we reach, you know, humanity will benefit. Of course, we require even more pervasive, detailed data collection, not only from humans, but for example, from, you know, the plants, animals, from everywhere. Because sometimes uh, this type of viruses, they transmit uh, across the species. So how can we detect that such a virus is migrating from the bat to some other animals? That would be the real challenge. But you know, we can have a lot, we can be very creative in the this. But for sure, we will need uh, to deploy many more sensing capabilities, even uh, non-silicon sensors. Of course, this will create some privacy issues, and especially because a lot of those future applications that we can deploy again to prevent those pandemics, we require a lot of use of mobile technology sensors. And of course, if you look at this ecosystem of mobile applications, there are a lot of privacy problems, privacy threats, and they come from very different components of our ecosystem. Cellular networks have shown to be a lot of vulnerabilities and the privacy breaches. For example, there are attacks such as a traceability attacks in which the movement of a person are, you know, can be identified. There are more sophisticated attacks like the torpedo attack which exploits a very specific protocol which is a protocol used to notify phones when they are in low power mode that calls or SMS messages are uh, being sent to the phone. This allows to, to, de to detect where a user is in a given location. Of course, you have a lot of problems connected with the data because we have a lot of uh, techniques powered by machine learning to do very good data connection. So you can link a lot of data sets. This is nice. But introduces, and this has been known since the third years, may introduce a lot of privacy needs. Data in general is not well secure or is not properly used. For example, data acquired for certain use is used for something. Mobile applications are very vulnerable. I'm not going to say more, but for example, they tend to acquire more data than they should. And I would say 10 years ago, we did an analysis on Google Play application, and we found that a lot of those applications also wanted to get the location data and the contact places, even though apparently they wouldn't need, the, for example, the location. Now, the use of machine learning and AI is opening the door to a lot of possible data breaches. For example, we have a very known inversion attacks by which one can learn information about individuals, so those data have been used to train a certain machine learning model. Worst in some cases, even when you deploy privacy techniques, the privacy protection is uneven for specific subset of users, for example, users who are underrepresentative uh, user uh, minorities. Finally, you have all these medical wearable devices with continuous data streaming, and those are typically are not very secure, so they can leak a lot of data. Now, if you look at this, you will, and actually, just for you to know, data go everywhere. This is a nice map that was done by a project of several years ago, I would say seven years perhaps, by Latania Sweeney where they trace the where medical data, where they go with that. As you can see, data go 
Sometimes they are partially anonymized, sometimes they are aggregated, but they go in many different places. Actually, when I saw this myself, I couldn't believe in my eyes. And in most cases, users don't even know. Now, this is a good note because some cases data needs to be transmitted for proper services. But users, if users were able to get an idea what happened to their data, this would at least educate them in being uh, more careful about their privacy. Now, in a way, since the privacy is gone, so when you look at this picture, you know, you say, you know, at this point, uh, what can we do for privacy? Okay? Uh, you know, in 1993, you would think you would search on the web and nobody would know anything about who you are today, of course, everyone can learn who you are. So there is a lot of things that we can do. We can say that we have a lot of privacy preserving technology. So we have, you know, research has progressed a lot and you go from, uh, you know, a network anonymized, a practical homomorphic encryption, secure multi-party, and so forth. You have a more, uh, you know, even uh, interesting ideas, not very well known, like uh, uh, context-dependent access control for streaming data and so forth. But one problem that we have with the privacy techniques is, first of all, privacy requires security. So our technologies have to be secure, because if you don't have security, you cannot have a privacy. But privacy is also very personal, and the different individuals have often different privacy preferences. In addition, today, and this is a, a really good for you know, privacy, uh, countries have started introducing privacy regulation, but that, those are very different from country to country. So coming up with privacy technologies, which work well everywhere is very difficult. At the end of the day, one minute we tailor them to different even culture, context, preferences, countries, and so forth. So there is a lot of work that we need to do uh, to again. What I think uh, what could be nice would be to combine those approaches for privacy protection in the, in the security area, people came up with the idea of uh, security protection in that. We needed to come up with holistic privacy preserving. However, a key question is personal privacy versus collective set. So the question is that, uh, you know, sometimes sharing your health care data may benefit the, you know, the other people. But the question is, how can we people make uh, reasonable choices about those questions? How can people say, okay, I'll, uh, you know, give my data to make sure that, you know, the community will benefit? How can we reconcile those two opposite choices? Now, there are, this is an interesting discussion, and there is a lot that we can do. In my view, good data transparency, good AI transparency, and policy based use of data are two key elements relevant to those issues. If we can solve those problems, this fundamental question, we will be better equipped to deploy our technology to solve the problems, like again, preventing pandemic. So I have done and uh, I think now I leave the floor to Latifur to introduce the next speaker. We're going to um, move towards Professor Ying Ding. Um, Professor, Ying, uh, Professor Ding, uh, could you please share your screen? Let me, I will introduce you. Give me one minute. Let me e email Philip. Make sure that um, he will give you the access. Okay, Pro Professor Ding is a full professor at uh, University of Texas at Austin. Before coming to Austin, uh, she was a, a faculty at uh, Indiana University at the School of Computing and Informatics. So her research has been uh, funded by NIH, NSF, and European Union funded projects. She published more than 200 papers. And she 
not only works in academia, she is very successful uh, to establish a company. She is a co-founder of Data2 Discovery Company, advancing cutting-edge AI technologies in drug discovery and healthcare. Her current research includes data-driven science of science, AI in healthcare, semantic web, knowledge graph, and um, application of web technologies. So let's hear from uh, uh, Professor Ding about how her work can uh, help us to overcome or curb a, a COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. So can you see my slide? No, I, we can see you. Okay, let, uh, Okay, you have to share the screen. That means I, uh, I share the whole screen. Okay. Uh, so you need to put up your, your presentation mode or something. I, I did. I shared the whole screen. So I uh, can you see now my screen? Yeah, yeah now we can see it. Yeah. That's okay, nice. great. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, you know, the research in my group. Um, uh, I collaborate with many groups and we did during this COVID-19 period, uh, try to cover uh, some of the talk is, uh, uh, topic uh, that uh, Lucky for uh, um, mentioned before. Um, so, um, yeah, I have disclosure, I'm co-founder of Data to Discovery. Um, and then we first, I want to mention, uh, so we tried to build a COVID-19 knowledge graph. So what we did is uh, before COVID-19 start, we actually built this uh, PubMed, uh, PubMed knowledge graph by uh, using um, BioBird to extract a uh, bioentity from 29 million PubMed articles, and also to uh, work with a group from UIUC uh, to do also name disambiguation uh, and also semantic scholar. Uh, and then we combine uh, um, all these different data set together. For, uh, we have a disambiguated authors. We have bio entity from each articles. Uh, we have uh, each, uh, ex uh, exporter data about project funding data. We also incorporate uh, ORCID ID, uh, which is uh, um, about the, if the author have ORCID ID, they will have their employment and education background. We also use some um, map affiliation uh, algorithm uh, to kind of process the affiliation data. So basically, uh, we uh, we be able to build a large scale knowledge graph, which uh, this uh, it's a public available. It's just published in scientific data. So uh, we have we have author, we have a PI, we have author affiliation, uh, we have their article and and the project and project and author co-author with other author. So this is a kind of simple statistics. Uh, how many authors we have. If we have a distinct uh, author ID is 14 million authors. Uh, we have uh, 8 million uh, affiliations. Uh, we have uh, bio entities, uh, 18 million bio entities and some mutations and uh, 1 million, uh, uh, okay, uh, 100,000 uh, 100, uh, NIH project. So this is a kind of a baseline uh, um, uh, data we have. So with this, uh, we incorporate, so this is uh, literature data from publications. And then we incorporate uh, with the data from data to discovery. So this is the data integrated from 20 plus different data set, uh, publicly available data set about uh, drug gene disease. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a manually curated uh, high quality. We integrate them together. So basically we have a very large scale uh, knowledge graph uh, related to uh, uh, drug gene disease about publications and and data. So we uh, we we took we took uh, uh, court uh, nineteen. This is the data set uh, released by White House. So it's available at Kaggle and also at the uh, Semantic Scholar. So currently they have two hundred over two hundred thousand uh, articles uh, related to COVID nineteen. So we uh, we took this data set did entity relation attraction because there are lots lot of more than 50% of data actually is preprint from archive by archive and uh, med archive. So we did this extraction about compound phenotype gene, biological process, enzyme, disease, and pathway. And we uh, then integrate with the PubMed uh, knowledge graph we built before, and we can actually um, create a knowledge graph for COVID-19, COD-19 articles. And we, uh, we can use pathfinding to do some interesting uh, 
uh, discovery. Uh, we can you even uh, get word uh, to work on the each uh, uh, entities uh, in the knowledge graph and to do similarity measures. So just show you one example. So this is uh, one small part of the knowledge graph for COVID-19. This is the remdesivir. So remdesivir is the drug uh, maybe many of you already heard. Uh, it's a, actually uh, it's one of the first drug actually being authorized uh, widely now uh, used for emergency use for uh, COVID-19 patient, especially those people with severe symptoms. So it's already been authorized uh, in India, Singapore, Japan, European Union, and the United States. Uh, so this is a, so this drug was originally de uh, developed by uh, Gilead Science. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a company, biotech company in 2009, actually for hep uh, hepatitis C, but now it can be repurposed for COVID-19. And from this COG-19 uh, COG uh, knowledge graph, you can see that uh, uh, remdesivir are connected with many other similar drugs uh, uh, and also including chlor chlor chloroquine and other things you may hear very often in the news and uh, other data, uh, um, um, other tweets. Uh, it also connected with some uh, Chinese uh, herb medicine like uh, uh, Shu Jie Du uh, ca uh, capsules. So this actually, just by building this uh, called 19 knowledge graph, they give, give us um, you know, broad knowledge about related to drugs, related to gene and related uh, 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 information. Uh, and uh, it also helped us to understand a little bit um, you know, beyond what is the COVID-19, so as a layman person. So we know that actually ACE2 is uh, on time, it's one of the important thing for uh, for COVID because it's actually, it's attached to the cell membrane. Um, and so once uh, uh, the COVID-19 virus, uh, they, uh, they, uh, their first step is uh, penetrate the cell membrane to enter the cell, then do millions of copies, self copies. So to do this first, they have to bind ACE2. So many drugs are for them to cure, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, under development or under repurpose uh, to, to cure COVID-19 is actually focus on how we can stop uh, the COVID-19 virus to bind ACE2. And just by look at this called uh, 19 knowledge graph, we can understand the ACE2 has been uh, this start in 2001. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a, a number of articles talk about ACE2. And this is a related entities, uh, co-occurrence entity with ACE2. So we can see there are some peaks in 2006 because SARS, uh, you know, SARS actually SARS and MERS are having have a similar uh, virus as COVID-19. So SARS started 2002 and 2004. So in 2001 and among 2006, uh, this air time. So this also this uh, uh, this ACE2 has been heavily discussed and it's kind of uh, cooling down. Um, then. MERS start. Uh, MERS is only in the Middle East, so it's not widely uh, spread. So 2012 to 2020, even now, MERS is still is related to COVID. So you can see, um, you know, uh, uh, knowledge related to ACE2, and you can see now start 2020 in, Mar uh, in, in January, February, March, and April, you can see the articles talk about ACE2 is going up, and uh, many of them actually start to talk about uh, uh, COVID uh, related uh, gene or drugs. So, so this is a uh, COVID-19 knowledge graph. Uh, we also did the patient risk prediction. So uh, we uh, work, uh, we uh, work together with Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, so which they have one of the largest and most diverse patient population across five hospitals in major health care system in New York City. And uh, uh, um, you know, we have a lot of um, uh, COVID-19 patient data, but actually people end up uh, in ICU is very little. That's why it's like uh, there are a lot of uh, very small data set for ICU test for COVID-19 patients. So basically our uh, EHR data collect information about COVID-19 patient, including uh, their, their status, the intensive care status, uh, demographics, and the lab test, uh, vital sign, comorbid uh, comor 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 uh, disease, and the uh, outcomes, um, uh, either they've been discharged or, or they died. So uh, for lab test and vital sign, this is a time series related because it's been constantly measured. Um, uh, so we including eight frequently measured the vital, uh, uh, vital sign, 
Um, and for democratic and other status is more static. So they, this in this approach, we have to, so basically we use LSTM uh, to process the time series data uh, related to uh, patient uh, uh, diagnosis, uh, lab test, and uh, use uh, demographic information to, um, to generate vectors. So these two vectors, we can cut them together and by consider the heterogeneous graph model, which we, uh, we actually separate death and discharge and uh, use patient lab test and vital to connect with this uh, different, uh, uh, different category. And by doing this, we, uh, we form uh, the latent embedding. Uh, with use the, this embedding, uh, we, uh, we could um, predict uh, the patient risk uh, of death or, or discharge. So uh, if this is a, uh, our experiment results show that our, uh, it's a, based on the graph uh, relational uh, learning uh, and I can achieve uh, a little, achieve a pretty good uh, high accuracy in record. So you can see the purple line is our IOC curve, uh, it's our method. And all the others are baseline method. So this is uh, on the uh, uh, patient risk. Uh, we also did misinformation. Uh, so uh, we started this really early uh, when the COVID really uh, just started. Uh, we actually start to uh, talk to our Chinese collaborators in China and to uh, get their data. So basically, we got uh, 3.3 3 million Weibo data. Uh, that time, um, uh, China started around December 2019. So uh, and uh, they also have a misinformation uh, collected from uh, Jiao, Jiao Zheng platform. So with two data set, uh, we will be able to answer the question is how misinformation and the gossip uh, misinformation we talk about is rumors and uh, pseudoscience. You know, actually, we know science play a very important role in this COVID-19, but, you know, also there's a lot of uh, pseudoscience inform misinformation has been heavily spread. It. You know, it's pandemic uh, and informatic. Uh, um, so it's uh, heavily uh, being actually spread in social media. So we, uh, we want to see how this uh, gossip and uh, gossip is inconclusive information. So basically it, there's no evidence to, uh, to verify this kind of uh, uh, output. So we, how this misinformation and gossip evolves through the different stage of uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic in China and how this uh, dissemination correlated with a significant news event and government policies. So this table is, uh, you know, all this, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the blue one is a rumor. Uh, the green, uh, the kind of green one is inclusive. Uh, it's it's uh, it's gossip, and the red one is a pseudo science. Uh, and all these uh, words, uh, text, if you cannot say, is a major news event. Start from January 20, uh, 26, 27, Wuhan lockdown and uh, um, President Xi visit Wuhan and uh, so on and so forth. Up to March, uh, March 27. So China cooling down much earlier than the rest of the world. So this is just shows how this information is uh, in spread. Uh, we, um, we also look in depth uh, about the temporal popularity of 10 most uh, misinformation posts on cure. So people, most of the pseudo science or gossip about cure, cures uh, for COVID-19 have been spread uh, in Weibo data. So Weibo data is kind of Twitter in China. So they talk about, we, we can see that like ginger, alcohol, tea, uh, even strawberry, uh, hot water, uh, you know, uh, uh, salt, uh, play all different roles, uh, uh, like uh, uh, this one, Shuang Huang Lian. So this is a Chinese herb medicine. Uh, they, you know, they actually spread, uh, they can cure COVID-19 and uh, the government has, so you can see the different, uh, this is uh, uh, by X is a time, time and why is uh, there uh, the number of uh, Weibo uh, uh, tweets among this, uh, uh, you know, misinformation post about uh, about cure? Okay, and and we also look at the fear, uh, the fear spread in this uh, uh, misinformation. So the fear was actually we categorize them as all these different category, uh, like a lockdown action, like a blame, uh, like uh, you know, uh, uh, infect the disease. Uh, and consequence uh, and some cure. So uh, we, we don't go to detail about this. And this is kind of a, a very interesting uh, event about um, one tweet that uh, from January 31, from Xinhua, uh, Xinhua Shi, 
试点。So this, uh, this is like People's Daily Tsinghua 试点 is the government, uh, um, official, um, Weibo, uh, site. So they release that, uh, Zhuang Huanglian can SHL is Zhuang Huanglian herb uh, remedy can inhibit, uh, uh, COVID nineteen. But people's spread is uh, it can cure uh, COVID nineteen. And uh, actually, uh, Ding Xiang doctor is actually uh, um, uh, it's not government, it's non-government, non-party uh, Twitter uh, host. Actually, it's a it's a kind of online community for physicians. So they come out actually against uh, uh, you know further verify, further actually uh, you know clarify what the government post uh, um, is like inhibited. It's not cure. It's a, it's it's a, it's it's a different meaning. So, so we try to explain uh, the misinformation spread around. So it's uh, it's we try to capture how this is the cascade of the Weibo data uh, data regarding this is uh, this uh, two tweets has been spread uh, in uh, in Weibo uh, in China. Uh, this is about misinformation. We also uh, did a little bit further in, uh, interesting thing that we we think uh, whether a pandemic actually can make our scientists become smarter or doing normal, much normal uh, research than before. So in order to think about this, uh, we actually use data to try to prove it. Uh, this, we, we, we put on the, uh, it's on the archive, it's kind of currently on the review. So um, we pick all the data from April about COVID-19. That time is the 58,000 uh, COVID-19 papers. Uh, we use BioBird uh, to extract the uh, um, by entities to model the novelty. So the novelty means uh, if the, the paper have two by entity, their combination is novel. It's a, uh, they never been combined before together. Mentioning the article before COVID, we think they have a high novelty. Okay, and uh, so we measure this and compare to twenty nine million article from previous uh, 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 publications. We can uh, calculate the novelty of COVID nineteen article uh, paper. We also pay attention about international collaboration, like we did for the misinformation. We collaborate uh, from people from China, and we see because this COVID uh, spread from China, Asia, then to uh, Europe, to 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 United States. I think international collaboration is the one of the most important thing. So we also look want to look at how this, um, you know, uh, uh, what is going on with this international collaboration. Unfortunately, we actually see the international collaboration going down uh, when the uh, COVID-19 starts. The third thing is we, we think about the parachuting collaboration. The parachuting collaboration means those, um, uh, those uh, pair of authors never collaborate before. They collaborate, they collaborate because of COVID-19. Uh, so we found the parachuting collaboration uh, uh, during the COVID-19 has actually increased a lot. So this is our uh, data model, how we uh, calculate this. This is our result. Uh, you can see um, the purple one is a parachuting that people never collaborate before they collaborate. It has jumped uh, around 2003 SARS pandemic. And then it's also have much bigger jump uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, okay. And uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the blue one, the blue one is international collaboration. You see, in the natural collaboration, is uh, um, uh, during uh, SARS um, pandemic actually has a great jump and has continuously improved about uh, uh, collaboration, but was actually significantly decreased. Uh, you see, big slide down uh, during COVID nineteen, and we think it's is a nationalism and the country blame each other. Uh, you know uh, uh, about the virus, so actually some country even have a policy stop. Um, prevent their scientists to, to do international collaboration. So that nationalism actually drive on this international collaboration decrease. Okay, so this is the international collaboration decrease. And we see the orange uh, is a novelty. We can see the novelty also have a, a jump in the SARS and, and pandemic. And uh, furthermore, it has a huge big jump uh, in the COVID-19. So uh, this is um, this is uh, from 2020 to 2000 to 2020 period. And if we can zoom in, uh, we, we go to January 2018 to April 2020 period, we can see, you know, more zoom in uh, detail, you can see the big change of uh, international collaboration uh, going down and the parachuting going up and the novelty has a huge jump. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a positive information during the COVID-19. Uh, yes. 
And uh, furthermore, we actually uh, build a uh, try to build COVID-19 portal. This is an NSF uh, rapid grant. So uh, we are working on like uh, first we try to show UT Austin, you know, what are the uh, tight uh, uh, COVID-19 paper being published? Uh, what are the bio entity they mentioned? What are the top bio entity about the disease, drug and gene? Who are the authors? And if they are, you are interested in authors, we can go to the uh, authors like uh, Jason McLean and um, he published uh, many articles related to COVID-19 and he is leading uh, the research uh, to develop DNA, DNA driven uh, vaccine for COVID-19. So it, he's uh, from UT. Uh, so this is uh, his publication and this is a collaborator, his collaborator. And uh, this is the disease of COVID-19. And uh, we can see from UT, uh, what are the papers uh, talking about this and what are the entities uh, people mentioned or keyword uh, mentioned in this paper. So we are building this uh, portal, it, it takes time. Uh, the challenge is uh, the name, also name disambiguation and, uh, and yeah, but we're working on this. So uh, yeah, that's my last slides. Uh, first, I want to thank my international uh, team. So we, we collaborate people from South Korea, China, uh, you know, uh, Seattle, uh, uh, UT Austin, uh, from, uh, you know, uh, from New Mexico. Uh, anyway, uh, a lot of different place. Uh, and, and this is my email, feel free to contact me. So that's my talk. Professor Ding, uh, for covering a lot of stuff related to COVID-19. So now we're moving towards the uh, third panelist. Uh, Dr. Sharath Ishrani. He's an executive director or CTO and adjunct faculty at University of California, San Francisco, uh, Baskar Computational Health Science Institute. Uh, before that, he used to work at Yahoo as a VP and Intuit also as a VP. He did a significant work in um, big data area and data science area. So let's welcome Dr. Ishrani. Are you able to see my screen? No, I can see you. Okay, there's probably a lag because I'm on full screen mode. We can see your slide. You can see the slide? Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you, Professor Latifur Khan for the opportunity to be here. I'm also really honored to be um, amongst CS professors, I, I note that. I'm a technologist and I've been a technologist from the beginning uh, in the tech industry for a long time. But in the last seven years, I've been in the, I made a conscious decision to move to medical, the medical world. It's been such a delightful uh, learning experience. Um, I decided to focus on a platform topic because yourselves uh, as researchers and many, many others in the audience, I thought uh, you would like to know a little bit about what is happening underneath. With that in mind, let me say there is a lot of COVID data coming out and it comes through government uh, collections and consortia and so on and so forth. But actually I argue that realizing the power of AI, it takes more than the data that you're seeing and it takes more than just the data. You'll see what I mean. Here is a dashboard that comes every um, day at the University of California Health System. Uh, this happens to be two days old. Um, the picture is pretty good. You can see our inpatients are, you know, down. There's a, there's a, maybe this is a secular trend. I, we think it is a secular trend, uh, but that may be the heading towards the third peak. But generally, uh, that's pretty good. In the ICUs, you've got uh, uh, quite a lot of capacity. There are just not that many patients right now in the ICUs of the five medical centers. Uh, UCLA, San Diego, San Francisco, Irvine, and Davis. The rolling seven-day test positive average is pretty good, um, uh, ranging from one to four percent, which speaks probably more to the denominator than to uh, than to anything else. So that's pretty good. Um, this is the kind of data that you see a lot of, but actually, is that the right data, and is it in the right place? Let me explain. The real questions that come are something like this, and you probably got a hint of some of these questions from the preceding two presentations, especially from Professor Yingdings. 
How does test positivity compare across patients who've had been a specific cancer drug regimen? You see, these biomedical researchers are sitting there looking at detailed molecular structures and so on, and they feel that they need to check out that patients who had a particular named cancer, I'm, I'm being vague on purpose, I'm not naming the specific things because the research is ongoing. Are they, do those people test positively uh, as much? And if you go across the entire University of California health system, you may see, you know, less than 20 patients like that. Um, how effective is remdesivir with past history of some other specified antivirals? Although I won't be specific, but you saw the picture from Dr. Yingding. You know, how effective they feel that the boost to remdesivir could be multi, multi, multi-fold. Well, how many patients do you think there are like this? Even with the giant University of California system, not that many. You might not get a big enough N. What are the social determinants? Uh, I'll show you more about that in a, in a couple of slides. Uh, you know, there are so many drug targets that are being identified. There's no way to actually test that many drug tar targets. How do you evaluate which ones are the most promising? And so what happens is research tends to make COVID look like a rare disease. Now, most medical systems are not actually ready for uh, this kind of inquiry. They're not really data science platforms. In that sense, they're stuck still in the 20th century and maybe even in some of them in the mid 20th century. Um, they're not exactly AI platforms. Let me tell you a little bit about what we've been doing at UCSF um, by focusing on a few things. First of all, you look at the yellow boxes You've got structured clinical data. That's what you see the most of. And people in the academic world talk about, academic medical world talk about data. They mostly seem to be talking about clinical data, which is, uh, which is what the clinical records are coming from the EHR. But there's a lay, great deal of value in the doctor's notes, the clinical notes, uh, from which using regular, not regular, but using smart NLP techniques, you can extract information. You are talking about uh, radiology images. You saw some of that from Professor Khan himself. Uh, that is extremely important. Uh, transcriptomic profiles, genomic profiles, uh, and you've got uh, immune assays in a disease like this, especially immune assays mean a lot. Now, all of these come together over here in, in what we call the information commons using systems like Spark, uh, Presto, which, which is a highly MPI-oriented execution, uh, TensorFlow and Horovit, again, for graphics, but distributed graphics. Apache CTX, which is open source clinical uh, notes recognition. Um, now, on top of that, you've got the Spoke Knowledge Network, and you saw some good illustrations of that in the preceding presentation. In the Spoke Knowledge Network, uh, we have already put uh, 35 biomedical reference databases. Many, many more to come that because that just got a big grant. Um, in late February, early March, uh, a team at UCSF, Dr. Doctors Nevin Krogan and, and, and all, what they did was they sequenced, uh, they, they teased out the full protein structure of the SARS-CoV-2, and they showed how it interacts with the human proteins. Um, those, uh, that interactome uh, very soon was put into the knowledge network. And on top of that, we've got this uh, layer called inquiry talent, tools and talent, Talent is extremely important in the medical world for all of this. We also recognize that there are many different types of computing profiles. You can't just throw a bunch of Linux machines and cluster and say, have at it. Okay, what does this mean? We also believe this philosophy that data is not data till it's fully queryable, which means completely joinable against each other. Anything should be related to each other, all programmatic. It's not like you just collect a whole bunch of documents and put it in one place or just a bunch of n different data sets and put that in one place, like a box folder, and that's data. No, that's not what we believe. And that's important philosophy. Now, um, what does it mean? You can speed up your queries two or three orders of magnitude. For example, you can ask questions, unsupervised pattern discovery, the hist histories of all COVID patients, including medical concepts. Now, switching from COVID to hypertension, which actually is a very complex condition, uh, find all the patients for whom we have three years worth of history before diagnosis and two years after, and tell the pattern differences between them. 
every record has a timestamp on it across all the billions of records, whether they are a lab reading or a patient visit or a, or a vital sign or a procedure or medicine. Everything has a timestamp. So imagine doing this across billions and billions of rows. What are the top 10 drug regimens we have for type 2 diabetes, which is another very complex condition, or anxiety, another one. At UCSF alone, we have 1,600 drug regimens for type 2 diabetes, and, and across the UC system, 6,500. So what happens is that your entire workflow changes. Queries that take two, three, four hours now take 30, 60 seconds using the systems that we have. And so your entire workflow changes when you issue a query, you don't go to lunch or a meeting. You, you start typing the next query. Um, in NLP extractions, you, know, you will see that patients who actually have been diagnosed with uh, uh, COVID show these symptoms. You're looking in front of them. You're looking, looking at them in front of you. Now, these patients didn't show these symptoms before being diagnosed positive. And patients who aren't tested don't show it and patients who test negative don't show it but once you once you show positive then this starts to happen these become one of the prominent uh, factors i'm taking a quick side trip over here just to tell you that we recently um, uh, landed dr yulin shuen from harvard she just finished her postdoctorate and, and and came to us and she is doing contract tracing via gps mechanisms uh, please, uh, you know, do contact her or contact me if you'd like to know more about that. But that's a little bit of a side trip uh, in, in the main structure of my presentation. Um, now, looking up at the knowledge network, a couple of things. Now, here, here you will start to see a lot of resemblance with Dr. Yingding's presentation. What happened was that, like I said, doctors Krogan and so on se uh, sequenced the SARS-CoV-2, and they... Uh, put the full interactome, we brought it to a knowledge network. And this is the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. It interacts with the ACE2 um, protein, which comes from the ACE2 gene. And then we saw in early March that dexamethasone is a possible compound that actually downregulates the gene protein, downregulates the gene protein that uh, upregulates the lung cells in ACE2. So it could be effective in controlling the severity of, uh, of uh, COVID. And as you saw, three or four months later, Oxford started a trial. This became an approved medicine. Uh, lastly, last slide that I have, here's something a little bit more complex. Uh, you know that patients, uh, who many of them end up with cytokine storms in the hospital, which is a very dangerous condition. Again, there's a SARS-CoV-2 spike protein it links to the ACE2 uh, human protein, which hops over to bradykinin receptors. There are two bradykinin receptors. Now, uh, at the intersection of the sort of the RAS area and the endocrine area, uh, then KNG1, this is the kininogen precursor of bradykinin. Uh, it's highly connected, it's a highly connected node. You can see it, it, it you know, it's connected, for example, it creates the, uh, down here, you can see the KNG1. That's the kininogen, very large protein. That cleaves into bradykinin and has many other effects. And so here is an example where you can take a more elaborate, somewhat more fuller knowledge network and see some reality going on. You probably know that bradykinin stops was reported about 10 days ago as a major factor for many patients. Um, as computer scientists, you look at them and say, I can see, I don't know, tens of thousands, maybe a million paths over here. What am I supposed to do with this? And, and you know, the domain experts will tell you that certain things like KNG1, kininogen, that's a very important protein, this and that. They, they can help you navigate through the solution space. But here's my point. We in biomedicine and the medical world are desperately short of talent. Uh, and that's where uh, the data science and computer science world can come in and work with them, join in with a domain expert, and let's set up some systems that will speed up medical research everywhere and come to some new frontiers. When this pandemic is done, the scorecard will show that data actually played a very big role this time. But the next one, we hope, will be even much bigger and better. Thank you.
how the data science can then help uh, to address your problems. So uh, we're interested to explore further anyway. So now we are well. Uh, we have the last panelist, which is Professor Ling Liu. So she will share her slide with us first. So let me introduce Dr. Ling Liu. She's a professor at uh, School of Computing or Computer uh, Science at Georgia Tech, Georgia Institute of Technology. She is the director of uh, DISL Lab, which examines various aspects of large-scale big data-powered artificial intelligence system and machine learning algorithms and analytics. She is a fellow, IEEE fellow and recipient of IEEE Computer Society Technical Achievement Award. He received numerous uh, best paper awards, including IEEE ICD DCS, the SEM WWW, SEM IEEE CJ Grid, IEEE Cloud, and the IEEE ICWS from this service con conferences. She's an editor in chief in IEEE Transaction or uh, I'm sorry, SEM uh, in Transaction on Internet Computing at this point. Uh, she, her research is uh, primarily supported by NSF and uh, and IBM. So let's welcome Dr. Ling Liu. Okay, thank you, Latifer. Can you see my screen? Uh, give us one minute, probably to show up. Yeah, you tell me you can see my screen, then I will start. Uh, you have to put in a presentation mode or yeah, I did. I did. Okay. So it's just uh, Philip is going to show it, I think. Uh, the Philip is saying he's not full screen. So can you see? I am on the on the full screen. Okay. Sometimes it takes one minute. And then I will redo it again just to make sure. She okay. said let's try again. Can you see it now? Yeah, it's coming. It's coming it's now? Yeah, not yet, but... Uh, because once I put in the in full screen, I cannot see anything. It's just a full screen. Mm -hmm. You just talk anyway. <laughs> yeah. Can, can the screen sound shows up now? No, we can see one. So, Felipe has the whole screen. He can, actually, he can just... Uh, just click on the on the flashlight by himself, right? Okay, let me ask. Because if I do my um, PPT share, I can actually see it. So. Can you see it now? Mm. She said it is normal. We may not see you, but you can just present. But I cannot see it. Can you see it? I cannot see it. No, no she said uh, just, uh, just click the full screen mode. Okay. And then you will be able to show project it on the screen or video. Okay. I, I clicked the, the, the full screen mode. Can you see it now? When presenting, it should on the screen. She's, uh, he said, uh, no, I think, why didn't you uh, do a full uh, screen presentation? I am doing a full screen presentation and I don't know what he can see, but I saw he has my full screen control. And uh, how come you cannot see it? Uh, I don't know what I should do. Because uh, when I did the testing, it works. We're going to unshare. Okay. Uh, uh, Philip, unshare. Yeah. okay. Let's wait again. So I don't do anything, right? How can I give the permission to the browser? Okay, so from the share screen. And then share. 
and you then you share to, application or share screen uh, app from the application you will share your they will list you all the powerpoint slides i'm already sharing the screen oh, okay. i can share my powerpoint slides so Is can you see it now can you see it now no are you you are not uh, selecting from application right you are selecting from i am uh, sharing the screen but uh, i do not know why or why you can e email me then i can run it from my end I mean. yeah because i if you run it on your end then you just tell me the next slide i will go to the next or oh, no that may... let me just try one more time sure uh why he cannot see that's what i do not know i was able to share before and can i share my screen using the application instead of the whole screen can you ask philip if he stopped having me share a whole screen i can just share the app it will work he said not application no i cannot do application no you don't use application for sharing use a yeah application uh, what, what there's the application what else you have I have uh, shared the whole screen with them, and uh -huh. that's what I'm doing. And I have shared application also. So now, can Philip see anything? Yeah, now he can see anything or not? We can see your screen. Which browser are you using? Google, Chrome. The entire screen, okay. I'm sharing the entire screen. It is what I'm sharing. I am sharing the entire screen. So is it a PowerPoint slide? Yes. Uh, the, there's a three choices, the share the entire screen and the share the application and the share, share, share the window. Then switch to PPT to slideshow now, okay. Slideshow, can you see it now? It is now slideshow now. Can you see now? Yeah, according to Philip, yeah, your screen is shared. So hold on. Okay. Okay. Yeah, open your presentation, please. Philip said, "Open your presentation, please." It is open. Should I close it? Open again. It is open. It's now in the in the sharing screen mode. He's asking you, do you have a two monitor? I don't have a two. I right now only have one. And uh, maybe I will send my, 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 my slides to, to, to Latifah then. Oh. Sure. And then let me go to my email. Uh, so, Latifah. So in the meantime, can I ask a question to the, um, uh, Dr. Ding, Ding Ding. So I saw your work, you talk about misinformation analysis, you talk about annotation, you try to classify rumors, gossip, those things. But in that case, I guess, assume you use machine learning algorithm, you need a label data, right, to build a model. So how much label data you use for the analysis? Or maybe we can do it at the end. Okay, I send it to you now, Latifa. Sure. I have actually very small number of slides. I have a three slide on it, so it's fast. I haven't got it. Did you get it? No, not yet.
Sorry, you want to start to talk a little bit and then once I get it, I'll put it there. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, you got it? Got it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so you have six slides. That's good. I actually have lots. I am choose the share of the So Philip, can you share my uh, share the slide what I'm from my end? Um, I'm showing Professor Leo's slide. Philip. So can you see the slide? Good. I can see now. No, <laughs> I cannot see anything but I can see now. Okay, so the last part. You can see it? So, yeah. Actually, okay. we have sweet life. So it's very fast. Okay, please start, yeah. Okay, so I see there's I hope. I don't know what's what one. Maybe I need to one you? Okay. Uh, so I I will talk about the three AI applications that are using three different type of AI technology. Um, the first one is audio video analytics. Um, did you hear echo? I hear a lot of echo on my phone. So anyway, I'll just talk. It's a very strange echo. Um, the first application is uh, basically voice detector. The second one is a talk detector. The third one is an online symptom, symptom checker. The last one is a thermal scanning detector. So I believe these set of applications provide a privacy preserving and a cheap technology to allow users to actually do a self checking and at home using their devices or using their private uh, login protected uh, um, web services. And I believe this type of user would be much more a uh, helpful for a broader population. Okay. Latif, maybe you need to mute your, your audio because somehow we echo a lot. And can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. So in these type of applications that uh, they are more useful for the users with uh, a privacy concerns, with concerns about uh, a expo exposure to their uh, families and French friends. And so I think these are the newer type of web services that should be developed after this uh, COVID-19 uh, conditions that uh, if people can see this type of service can be significantly helping the large populations to be able to timely getting treatment, getting a test. And in addition to this uh, massive uh, public environment uh, uh, doing the temperature uh, scanning and uh, it's also the type of uh, services. I think it provide a capability of our user to use their own online services, online devices to do that. It's much more uh, attractive. Okay, next slide. So the next one that I will mention is uh, related to the previous one. And in the previous one, I didn't mention one thing, which is whenever you did a, a, a call detector or the voice detector, so you are using a sample of the COVID patient as the guidance, as a supervised learning. And most of the learning can have errors. 
So therefore, we should always provide validation for all kind of detections. We should never rely on a single reference point to actually make a, a decision. So multiple parallel services on different type of uh, a, a symptoms or different type of uh, sensing devices that will be actually helping significantly. Now, next thing is uh, um, robotics and uh, drones and robots. Basically, this area is uh, already in the COVID-19 becomes very, very practical because you can use drones to drop medical supplies. You can use robots to deliver food, medicines to the patient. But there are also some issues here. For example, they, you have, we have to provide a, a, using AI to provide a validation, deliver validation and error back. So because of these kind of medical devices, medical supplies and medicines are actually a critical for people's health. And we cannot afford to have errors. So that's the reason why I believe that a newer type of technology that provides verification and validation and over the existing a, a detection systems, delivery systems, they are very, very important. And that's also one of the newer um, service challenges that is very useful for the entire the service community who are thinking about it. And because in addition to AI technology, in addition to privacy, we also need to validate the delivery quality and the delivery correctness and the delivery accuracy and the service quality. Because these are very, very important. This kind of service quality is no longer performance, latency, throughput, but rather the correctness, the accuracy, and the error, right? So that's very important. The next one, the third, yeah, the third technology is uh, another thing that I, I think is very useful. So the, today we have a so many a tracing capability, monitoring capability. They are all very aggressive and very intrusive to user uh, privacy their own a comfort zone. So I'm thinking that actually a lot of the, and we have two kind of things. One is provide a lot of consultation service and communication tools, recommendation services, allow the, anybody can actually access um, nearby scenes, nearby testing centers, nearby choice of alternatives, making things easier for everyone. And in addition, that if we want to do a tracing and a monitoring, we should provide a more a privacy comfort, a comfortable privacy, a preserving a, a type of uh, tracing system. So I give you an example. Lati Frida can show the next one. Yeah, so basically, for example, if uh, if uh, I do not want to be traced by public uh, service. But I will be willing when I go to the store, I scan the barcode. And this barcode will allow me to, to, to obtain a URL or a PDT board that allows me to check that after I finish shopping, that if this store has any issues, that during which period of time shoppers should be alerted, then I could go, go there and help myself. So I do not want to be tracked by other people, but I could providing the capability to tracking for myself, right? So this type of uh, services would be much more a, a user friendly and would uh, allow a lot more users to be able to um, to subscribe and use those services without worrying about their privacy issue. And that they also, they do not have any issue of, uh, of a free unsubscribed kind of service because every time they go to a location, they check in by simply scanning a, a, a barcode to get a, to get a little board where they can search for information and they don't give out anything. So that's what I think is a, it's a new way of looking at a, how do we provide the service using AI technology while protecting users of privacy, protecting users of security and many other concerns. So that's all that I want to say. 
Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I think I muted. So let me start. Okay. So now, uh, thank you, Dr. Leo, for giving a wonderful talk uh, in spite of some difficulties at the beginning, technical difficulties. It's nothing with the technical, but mostly presentation. Problem. <laughs> so yeah, so I learned how the drone can be used uh, for the to to take care of the issue related to COVID-19. That's interesting. And also, you talk about the chat bot that's interesting can be used in the COVID-19 situation. So this is an interesting work. And now uh, the floor is open for the question and answer. So there was a question from the one of the participants. I think his name is Leo. So he said how the social media can be useful to predict the COVID-19 outbreak. So if you uh, at the beginning, I tried to say that uh, if the COVID-19 outbreak occurs at a certain location in the next 14 days, number of tweets uh, related to COVID-19 will be increased significantly. So the challenge here is from the social media, you have to uh, gather the tweets and identify those tweets related to COVID-19 and related to a particular geographic location, country or state. Then if the number increases over time in a certain window, then you can say that the COVID-19 might be, might may occur there in future. So the, there is a, some analysis from various, uh, from Weibo in China. So they show that uh, they can correctly predict in advance, 10 days or 14 days in advance that this areas, areas means a uh, province or a country will have a COVID-19, not in a particular small geographic area is not possible. But anyway, if uh, any panelists want to add anything in that direction, that's fine. I just want to mention that IBM T.J. Watson had a project 10 years ago where they were analyzing a lot of data and predict the flu outbreaks. Yeah. So, oh, it's, that seems a very nice application and seems can be easily done in a way. So. Yeah, so that's a, yeah, it's related to flu outbreak, outbreak prediction. Any other panelists want to add anything? That's yeah, fine. we experience. Sorry, I yeah, go ahead. Next time, we only have nine minutes left. Sorry. Oh, we can take another five minutes. Uh, okay. Minutes. <laughs> yeah, I think also social media data is very noisy, and uh, most time you don't get their lo geolocation. Uh, it's mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So and cascade of uh, social media, it's uh, pretty hard from our side. Like when we deal with Weibo data, it's very hard to trace how the information being spread through the cascade model. It's uh, pretty hard, unless you have a large scale uh, social media. Yes. That's true, but uh, in general, uh, you need uh, to link uh, this data with other data sets, because uh, then it will give you very accurate data. That's where AI can be very useful, okay? Because sometimes you have a user location through mobile cellular networks, so you, you can uh, have this information. Okay. 
Yeah, I agree with the both of you. Uh, the data is very noisy, and also people don't want to share their location due to the privacy. There are some work that shows that only one percent uh, Twitter users or number of tweets will one percent tweets will have the location information. So in that case, uh, you have to if you want to extract the exact location is impossible. But you can identify say this tweet is associated with a, with a particular country. That type of thing is possible. So at that level, I think uh, our outbreak, COVID-19 outbreak prediction is feasible. So with regard to uh, Professor Bartino, you talked about uh, contact tracing where privacy preserving may be uh, useful work, but when you use privacy preserving contact tracing, it may add some overhead, right? So do you think that overhead will be significant in terms of the speed or in terms of any false positive is possible? Not really, because of the way the techniques, if you look in details at the technique really provided by company, even like Google and Apple, they are very quick. They rely some on Bluetooth connection. So you get some token which is anonymized by other phones. And so they have a mechanism and sending those tokens is really very small amount of information. Okay, thank you. And uh, that are uploaded on some cloud, the things can be very quick actually, so it's not really good. And uh, Professor Ding, so you showed that misinformation analysis, uh, you do, you try to determine the rumor or gossip. So there I assume that you apply some machine learning technique. Since you apply machine learning technique, you need to provide the annotation of label data. So how much uh, level that you provide? Did you try supervised learning or semi-supervised learning or what type of learning you try? We, uh, you know, uh, I think it's better we talk about uh, uh, the, the risk, uh, the, the EHR data. We actually use uh, constructive learning, mm -hmm. constructive learning and pre-training. Uh, the, the problem, yeah, the pre-training is similar like uh, transfer learning, but uh, mm -hmm. the problem is with COVID, patient end up in ICU, it's uh, very small data set and lots of misinformation. So we hope we can, we are we're now develop pre-training algorithm on this um, other, you know, related disease uh, that we think uh, relate to COVID and that the patient has a longitudinal longer data set. And with that, we can hope that pre-trained model can be applied uh, in COVID-19 patient to predict a uh, discharge of, of, of death. So that's uh, one kind of uh, pre-training uh, uh, pre model we're working on. Constructive learning, yes, we, we use constructive learning to deal with these things. Um, and uh, we, yeah, normally we just, yeah, we use LSTM. Uh, we, we also work on the image data as well, like uh, a chest, chest S3. So um, the, the major problem is uh, we don't have a labeled data. So uh, to generate the bunny box uh, for the, uh, for the for the image, uh, we uh, use a kind of uh, um, we use radiomics. So radiomics is actually uh, the features pre uh, before uh, deep learning and machine learning that is used by radiologists. It's a it's a it's a, it's, a, it's a metric features uh, is a vector of metric features. And if we combine uh, radiomics with CN feature together, we can achieve a better result. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. But I have a question myself. So looking at this virus, it seems very different from the previous, from similar families, from the same family. I wonder, you know, in the future, it would be very important to determine this very quickly. Well, this is, it is taking a long time. Still, the scientists don't know a lot. So in my view, for the future, speeding up those analyses to be critical. I can comment a little bit on that. That's a really good point. In fact, um, if you go behind the scenes, you learn how uh, they managed to sequence the virus very quickly in China. Then they uh, sent the sequences over. And then now these mutations keep occurring, I'm told. And those mutations are quickly caught also, quickly identified. And then in the beginning, you know, one of the things these scientists, drug discovery folks do is they, they look for potential drug targets and so on and so forth. And apparently things that used to take uh, 60 days to come up with one target are taking two days or took two days this time. Uh, and uh, 
similarly, clinical trials, as you know, have been going very much faster. And a lot, I'm told a lot of the reason for that is the data analysis has been happening much faster. I think we're learning a lot of lessons, but obviously as computer scientists, we, we tend to think that these things should be happening in seconds or hours, not in weeks and days. So I, I think there's a little bit of that involved over here. Exactly, but, but we needed to figure it out why they're taking so long, you know, that, that's what that was my question. Why? Because we needed to know, otherwise in the future we would be stuck with the same thing. Agreed, completely yeah. agreed. Yeah, because you know SARS, SARS started in 2002, they know the target, but till now they don't have uh, medicine for SARS. So they spend a lot of money for the last uh, decades. They couldn't. So one of the major reasons is like ACE2 is a, so there are two stage for this COVID-19. First is ACE2, you binding with your cell membrane to copy. Then the second is uh, immune system storm. Uh, you actually destroy your whole immune system. And people most die because of the cyto, uh, like uh, immune yeah, system storm problems. Yeah, yeah. Cytokine yeah. storms. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but ACE2 is everywhere. It's in your lung, in your kidney, in your intestine. It's everywhere. So, uh, you know, for this drug, is a, a target spread around your body. Uh, if if one drug bite on your lung, it also will bite uh, in your kidney, in your intestine, in everywhere. So that's always it's a major uh, barrier to develop a compound that only bind ACE in your lung or only bind specific things. That takes quite a long time. And second, normally it takes the it takes fifteen years to develop a new drug. Yeah. Two billion dollar, fifteen mm -hmm. years, and ninety seven percent fail rate. You know that's why recent years we don't have a new drug come out because it's so difficult. Um, yeah, even we have so much data, genome data, everything like scan. We have so much uh, a, a great advantage, but in drug discovery, we're still guessing actually at the moment. Yes. I have a question though. Finding out that this virus could be bind with every organ in the body, how long did, did, did that discovery took? Yeah, because those who can generate severe side effects. So that's why all these drugs now being, being repurposed for the COVID-19 has all kinds of side effects. Even remdesivir has all kinds of side effects because of this, uh, the target is this off-target side effect or uh, on-target side effect is too severe for this kind of disease. Yeah, but my question was a different, uh, because the people in the beginning underestimate how lethal this virus could be. Even understanding that uh, right away could have helped a lot. I'm, and I understand the drug the discovery is takes one, but at least understand this is very dangerous. This took a long time also, to be honest. So can this at least be shortened in some way? Yeah. You know, so or you have to wait for people to die in large numbers to discover this? Unfortunately, yeah. there's some truth to that. Um, yeah. when you, because, because mechanistically, the body is not understood very much at all. You are mostly mm -hmm. observing empirically, observationally. And so when you see enough of something happening, then you say, oh, there's something there, we should go pay attention. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Istani, uh, Dr. Istani, I, I, show, I saw you talk about knowledge network. So yes. I have a question. Uh, so when you researcher build this knowledge network, so it is that I assume that it's not fully automated. It may be semi-automated or... Uh, no. what I meant, uh, hmm? Sorry, go ahead. No, what I meant, so people want to start this network or some sort of ontology or knowledge base, so this knowledge base is not fully automated way constructed. Human will, will in the loop or how you know, this construction um, is done? This I think you saw some layers over here. One of them is that uh, there are these actually very large number of data sets that are accepted medically as biomedically as true. This is true. We accept this as the truth. And then, you know, those are manually taken and conflicts between them are resolved, such as different uh, relationships, you know, mean slightly different things and so on. And sometimes even within Uniprot, you have more than one representation. So these things start to get resolved, but those are very well curated. Uh, on top of that, you can have something like you saw from uh, Ying Ding as well, which was to look at all the PubMeds and to semantically extract relationships and put them on top. Then you may have 
a little bit less confidence in those relationships. Um, and then on top of that, you can put other things. You can, you know, for example, if you have to happen to have a large corpus of clinical data, you can look at all the clinical data and say, we seem to find some relationship between, between uh, malaria and uh, sickle cell anemia. We don't understand it, but there's a relationship. Now, of course, we understand that one. But so you can build these different layers of quality. Um, the lowest one can be the least automated, then they get more automated above that. But the lowest one also can be refreshed somewhat, somewhat automated basis. All the data sets only get refreshed every six months or one year. OK, thank you. Uh, uh, Rosalinda, I have a question uh, for you. That, uh, you talk about chatbot, uh, that uh, automated uh, system that will interact with the user. So there, I think some content generation might be an issue, right? Also, the uh, the speak uh, the if the content may be in a mul multilingual set, pro needs to provide multilingual support, that type of thing. To me, that I mean, each uh, each country, each language region should provide a web services for that region, right? Mm -hmm. So, today the logic translation is not too difficult for the simplistic type of uh, question answer. So it's really how to provide a good uh, automated uh, services that allow users to benefit by using those services. Okay, thank Which you. Which is still missing, yeah. Okay, thank you, Rosalie. So uh, there is a follow-up question from the uh, from the participants or audience. Uh, I We talk about that uh, social media uh, data can be useful to predict the COVID-19 out outbreak, but uh, the uh, zoo is talking, feeling that um, a pandemic already happens, so it is not a prediction. Actually, it's a post-analysis or something like this. So I agree with that. Most of the work, the, I, I noticed that when they publish this work of uh, how to show that COVID-19 outbreak can, um, can be predicted from the social media, that's actually post-analysis. Uh, but I haven't seen any work in real life where they show that in advance they can predict. As Professor Bartino said, uh, for the flu detection, it was very successful. So we are hoping that in in, uh, in future outbreak, COVID-19 outbreak, social media may play a role. We don't know. So, yeah. so do you want to add anything? Yeah. Okay. So I think... I think uh, we were at the end of the session. So, any thank you very much for everybody to participate in the session. And thank you, thank you all, of you, all the panelists, especially uh, Professor uh, uh, Leo, King, Professor Bartino, and Dr. Shal for attending the session. And thanks to, to all the participants who were there and listening our, our conversation. Thank you again. Bye, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. See you Good next time. Bye, Linga. Yeah. Bye, Linga. Yeah. Bye, Linga. 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 Bye, Lin